So today's lecture is going to be about functions and function definitions. Functions are segments of code which you can call from other places in code over and over again so that you don't have to rewrite that same bit of code over and over. So that can be useful for, say, outputting specific formats of data, for doing calculations, things you do over and over again, or things you want to encapsulate and make look neat and tidy. It's a concept in programming called black boxing. It's so that you put all your complicated bits that work together in one area so that if something goes wrong, it's very easy to trace back to what the issue originally was. Now, the function you should all be very familiar with is the main function, which is this function here. This is the function from which all other functions are called. It's the function that is run when the program first starts. So this is a good example to look at how functions are formatted. Now the first thing is that it's declared as an int. It, the name of the function is preceded by some sort of variable data type. That refers to the kind of data that this function can return. So if you see here that at the end of the main function is this command called return. That's the data that it gives back to whatever called it. So you can use a function to do some math and then it can return a value so that you don't have to calculate it by rewriting code again, you can just have the function do it. Now the next thing to notice is that all the data is encapsulated within these curly brackets. So everything that is within this, these curly brackets is within the scope, it's a word to remember, is within the scope of this function. And the last thing are these open close parentheses. These are the function arguments. These are the th this is where you can put things to pass to the function, and we'll look at that in just a second. So let's go ahead and start by writing our function. Now, depending on the environment you've used will depend on where you can put function definitions. For the sake of this video, I'm only going to be defining the function within the body of it, or within its entire method definition. What that means is I'm going to create a function not anywhere else, or I'm not going to enumerate the function, I'm just going to define the entire thing. What that means for you is I'm going to put all of the code above main. That's the trick with code blocks. You have to put all the code above main if, before you define it, or before you can actually define it. Um, that's going to vary depending on the programming language and the environment. So it's just useful to know what's what and what works with which environment and language. It's also a style thing. Where you going, where you define your functions is completely up to you. It's all about how you make it readable and how you like it to look. So that's all up to you. So to start, I'm going to create a function called print stuff. So I call it print stuff and I have the open close curly brackets and then I've got the open close parentheses. Now, I'm defining this function as a void. Now this is a, a type def we haven't seen before. Void means that the function isn't going to return anything. It's just a blank function. So void functions are very useful if you're just going to be outputting the same thing over and over again or if you're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. It's useful for initializing variables or just places where you don't have to output things. So I can put in here uh, see out, and I'll just print some stuff. So that'll just print some stuff out. Now to call a function, I'm going to go into main, and I'm going to call print stuff, which is defined like that. You just put the name of it and then the open close parentheses. Now the open close parentheses are, where, remember, where you'd put the function parameters, but this function doesn't have any parameters. In fact, you can even go so far as to call this void like so to tell it it doesn't have any parameters, doesn't change the functionality of the code, but again, just a style thing. So if I run this, you can see it runs the print stuff. It prints out exactly what print stuff was told to print. Now I can make a void function which takes arguments. So I can create this new uh, I'm going to call this print numbers or print number and it's going to take an integer a now 
this is where a thing called scope comes in. This is a function parameter, and this variable is only accessible to this function. So in here, I'm going to say C out, and this is just going to print a, uh, the number A. So if I change this to print number, and I've put in, I've got an array initialized, so I'll print in print R0, which should print out 9, which it does. A is only accessible within this function, so I can't say above print number A equals 10. In fact, if I try to do that, it'll say error A was not declared in this scope. Let me zoom in there a bit. So a, a was not declared in the scope. So any any variable you define within a function or as part of the function parameters is not accessible anywhere else. These are called local variables. If you want to create a variable which is accessible to everything, you have to put it outside all the functions. This is called global scope. In fact, code blocks very nicely tells you what scope you're in. So because I'm outside everything else, I'm in global scope. If I go in here, oh, never mind, that doesn't mean what I thought it meant. So if I put it outside everything, it's in global scope. So if I create an integer called global and make it 10, and then I can access that variable from within this function. And if I run this, it prints a, it prints the variable a, and then it prints global. Now, because anything can read it, it also means anything can access it, which is a danger when it comes to global variables, because you might not know who's accessing what or who has accessed it, so you're unaware of what the state of that variable might be. So they should be used with caution, because again, anything can change and modify it. But global variables are also incredibly useful if you need to keep track of just global parameters. So that's what the scope of a variable is. It depend it makes it accessible to various parts of code. So there are local variables and global variables. So let me take that out. So these are two void functions, one which doesn't take any arguments, when one that does. And now I'm going to create a function which um, returns something. So I'm going to make this function return an integer. And I'm going to call it greater. Here. There's already a function called greater, so I can't use that. So I'm going to call it bigger. There we go. And it's going to take two variables, int a and int b. Now, a and b are both local variables. Now, I'm going to make this function return whichever of these two numbers is bigger. So I'm going to use a conditional. If a is greater than b, I'm going to return a. Else, I'm going to return b. And I'm going to compile that. So here I'm using I'm making use of if statements and returns. You can have a function which has as many arguments as you want as of many different variable types as you want. The only limitations are you can't use the same variable name more than once as you can't do in normal programming. And well that's really it. Note that all of the function parameters are separated by a comma. So this is just a basic conditional statement. If a is greater than b, I return a, else return b. Any function which returns a variable should return, or returns a value, should return a value. You should always make sure that it does that. If there is a route which doesn't, say if I get rid of this, so there is now a possibility that this function doesn't return anything, the compiler will still let you do it, but it will create a warning, control reaches end of non-void function without a return. So it's warning you that you couldn't get some undefined behavior. So it's always b best to make sure that there is always a return. In fact, that's proper style. 
Now remember that the else is the catch-all. If it doesn't go into this and all other situations, it will jump to this. Now, I don't actually have to use an else statement. I can just say return b. Why is that? Well, the second I say if a is greater than b, if that's true, it's going to jump straight into this and hit return a, and that will end the function. It will jump back to where it was, giving back a. All other times, it's going to exit this, or it's not going to run this, and it's going to go to return b, and that's going to end the function anyway. So, again, it's all about a style thing. Um, in this way, it's actually slightly more optimized, because there's no else statement, but you really don't have to worry about that at an introductory level. Just know that there are multiple ways you can do this, and again, it all comes down to how it looks to you. So we can test this. So I'm going to say, in fact, I'm going to make use of two functions. I'm going to say print number, and I'm going to nest a function within a function. So I'm going to say bigger uh, r0 or r3. So r0 is 9 and R3 is 4, so it should print out 9, and so it does. So that's how you create functions that take basic arguments, and again, you can use any of the variable data types that you know to return or take as arguments. Now, you can also take an array. Now, there are two ways to take an array. One is as a pointer, which we haven't gotten to yet, and the other is to take it as an array itself. Now, this is, was a question. This was an exercise in the last video with loops, and this is going to be the answer to that. Uh, what I want to do is create a function which is going to calculate the average of this array. So we're going to create a function called average, and it's going to take int array, and then it's also going to take the size. And I'm just going to put in a blank return. Now, the thing about this is you can't pass the size of it, or it's not always best to pass the size of it. You want to create functions which are very general so that they can be used in quite a few cases. So I'm going to pass to this just an array. It only knows that it is an array, and I'm going to pass to it the size of the array. In fact, I think that that's going to give me an argument, so I'm just there an issue, so I'm going to call this R size. Uh, now, to accomplish this, I'm going to create a variable which is a floating point, and I'm going to call it the return variable, and I'm going to initialize that to zero. Then for int i equals zero, i is less than array size. So this is I'm creating a for loop which is going to step through all of the values in the array. Ret plus equals array i. So I'm going to sum all the values of the array into this variable called ret or the return variable. And then I'm going to divide ret equals ret divided by array size. And then I'm going to return ret. So now if I say, I can't use print number because that takes an integer, not a floating point. I'm going to say C out average, and I'm going to pass to it the array. And this is an array of size 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. An array of size 6. And now if I run this, see the average of this is 14. So that's how you pass an array to a function. It's not the best way to pass an array, but it is one way, or it is the way you know thus far to do so. Now, I would said we can't use print number to print out the average, because we've already got a function which is called print number, but it only takes an integer. There's something which is very nice, which was an improvement over function definitions in C, and that's the concept of function overrides. So what I can do is I can create another function called print number, and I can give it a completely different argument, but it will still reference, or it will, the compiler will know which function to pick based upon what kind of input argument I give it.
So it's going to be almost, it's actually exactly the same function. But this one will take a floating point instead. Um, I'm going to modify this because I didn't think I'd pick such nice numbers to work out. If I try this again, 15. Oh, because these are all integers. Right, okay. I'm going to cast this to a float. Oh, no, it returns. That's the issue. There we go. I was wondering why that would work out so nicely. And I'll cast that to a float anyway. Cast this to a float. This is so you can see the active process of debugging. And if I run that again, still gives me 15. That's a floating point, int, int, int. There we go. So that works. Okay. So now I'm going to say print number. And now I can say average array is 6. And run this. Yep. Oh, that's right. I don't have to put that in. There we go. All right, try that one more time. There we go. So that's how function overriding works. As long as you use the same name, the compiler knows which function to pick based upon which function argument you give it. So that's something that's really nice about this. So that's pretty much it for function definitions and variable scope. Don't think that there are too many common errors that there are. I showed you what happens if you don't put a return variable in a function which requires a return, or a function which should return a variable. And this is the code which is the answer to the exercise in the last video. So I hope this makes sense. Because it's a fairly it's a fairly straightforward thing. If you don't know how to calculate the average, that's an easy thing to Google. I do recommend that you look up how to calculate the standard deviation and try writing a function which does that. That will be the exercise for this video. In which case, you guys should do that. And I will see you in the next video.